Firstly, we must define what is meant by the term angel. Traditionally, an angel was a messenger sent by God. These could come in almost any form imaginable, from three strange visitors to a bush that was burning but was not consumed, or from wheels within wheels to a reed fence whispering a name and could bring accompanying symptoms including many alike those arising from exposure to radioactive elements and visions along with them ranging from seeing a ladder to heaven to a harlot riding atop a great beast with seven heads and ten horns. In ancient theist scriptures, all such visions were associated with dreams, fevers, and drugs, and this much is attested to even in monotheist apocrypha, such as the Essene Book of Giants and the Coptic Christian Gospel, the Book of Enoch both of which describe dreams as being messages sent to us by God, decipherable only by those who best understand the messenger. Thus, dream interpretation has played an important role in the history of Western monotheism and occurs often in its mythological scriptures. In Western monotheist cosmology, the different forms of angelic appearance listed throughout the Bible are cataloged according to seven different choirs, orders or types, occupying seven different heavens, orbital spheres, ruled over by seven different archangels associated with the five nearest planets, with Earth's moon, and with the sun. Thus the description of cherubs as winged males derives from the association of the choir of cherubim with the winged and bird-masked priests of the seven Apkalu sages sent by the Anunnaki, gods in ancient Sumer while the concept of a flaming serpent form of angel is derived from the seraphim choir who are symbolized in ancient art as shooting stars, i.e. comets and meteors. Both birds and celestial events having already long been seen as omens or portents foretelling future changes. While simple augury, such as by examining the contents of bird entrails, is prehistoric in origin, the far more complex method of theurgy, or angel summoning, using ritual magic, may have been developed as recently as the European Dark Ages. In this, each of the seven archangels is assigned a day of the week, and each planetary ruler associated with these is then, in turn, assigned certain hours of day and night at which summoning the associated archangel or any of its affiliated lesser messenger angels is appropriate. This method of ritual timing by the planetary tables of the hours was used alchemically, for example, to infuse seven kinds of metal with these seven types of spiritual essence in making different types of superstitious amulets and talismans. If these relics are, indeed, thus infused with any more than merely a psychosomatic or placebo effect, remains as of yet untested by modern science. Next, to determine the nature of the angels supposedly 
summoned by the theurgy invented or discovered by John D. and Edward Kelly in the late 1500s A.D. We must examine D.'s own beliefs about them, the condition of D.'s mental fitness to judge, and lastly, we must judge D.'s angels objectively by the light of popular morality today. D. called the angels he and Kelly communicated with Enochian because, he wrote, they told him they were the angels known to the patriarch Enoch. Whether or not D. believed this statement by them, or any they made to him subsequently, is irrelevant besides the fact that, from thence onward, he loyally transcribed all their meetings and conversations, and carried out all their requests and demands. Being anal retentively fastidious, as his works prove, D. followed through on his end even to a fault. To scientifically test the veracity of his vision's claims, D. staked his own wife, and, ultimately, his fate later in life did reflect that choice. In short, it is safe to say that to the same extent D believed these angels truly real, that belief drove him into paranoid schizophrenic senility. Some latter-day proponents may raise the imperfect vessel argument, but by comparison to the moral sensibilities of modern post-Puritan Western monotheists, it should not be arguable that the angels' later requests of D were made in poor taste, at least, if not having been an outright fraud perpetrated on the elderly D by a sadistic, predatory Kelly. To put it bluntly, D opened a portal to an undiscovered country inside the human psyche and, in his altruism, attempted to bring his own sense of human order into it. The result is the Enochian system. Now, today, we may review such apocryphal gospels as the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants and learn much more than ever Dr. D. had realized about the angels who were supposedly known to Enoch. In the Book of Enoch, he is visited by one of the seven archangels, whom shows him the fate of the Anunnaki, or fallen rebel angels, that they are to be hung in midair above a boiling, sulfurous lake inside a hidden cave. Thus, there are two types of angels that were known to the patriarch Enoch, the good archangels and the evil, fallen Anunnaki, or rebel angels. In the canonical Book of Genesis, it is written that these rebel angels had transgressed the will of God by breeding with the wives of men and begetting offspring by them, a race of giants and heroes like the titans of old. Then, to exterminate these giants, sometimes called the Nephilim, God sent the deluge, the mythic world flood, and this event erased them from existence. In the Book of the Watchers chapter of the Book of Enoch, it describes in detail how these rebel angels taught early people the basic arts of civilization, including how to make clothing, jewelry, cosmetics, incense and oils, medicines and poisons, and how to smelt metals, among many other things. The legend continues that, while these Anunnaki rebel angels became demons in hell, the Nephilim giants themselves became the jinn, or genies, non-corporeal ghosts that may be summoned by, and even trapped in, certain amulets and talismans. It was supposedly these genie, 
that King Solomon called upon to help construct the first temple to the monotheist's god ever erected, and, thus, the seventy-two names and sigils of the Goetia, or Lesser Key, Grimoire of King Solomon, whether authentic to him or from a later era and elsewhere, also refer to these same genies, or ghosts, of antediluvian giants. So the question becomes, finally, were the angels summoned by Dee and Kelly, if truly Enochian in origin, the good archangels, the evil Anunnaki, neither or both? The Four Watchtowers Tablet of John Dee's Ritual Magic Enochian System remains today one of the most important, although also one of the most misunderstood, documents on astrophysics and number theory ever written by the hand of any human being. It is, quite obviously, encrypted containing a series of 92 sigils of seven-letter cells each on a layman with a total of 675 cells, 624 if excluding the black cross. But this means it can also be deciphered and its authentic meaning revealed. So let us decrypt D's Enochian system first by removing its Enochian alphabet and denuding the four watchtowers of any trace thereof. Then what remains left over is just an empty grid, so similar to the later Cartesian coordinate grid, both being divided into quadrants by a black cross of one vertical and one horizontal bar. The sole difference is, in D's model, each quadrant is composed of 12 vertical columns and 13 horizontal rows, creating a total of 156 cells per each quadrant. This is the skeletal structure of John D's entire Enochian system. The reason each quadrant is 12 columns wide by 13 rows tall is because each quadrant or watchtower in D's model is also divided within itself into four smaller sub-angles or four quadrants within each quadrant by a deacon cross of six by six cells. Each sub-angle quadrant consists of 30 cells and the deacon crosses that divide between them all are comprised of 36 cells apiece. Thus there are four deacon crosses, one per each watchtower quadrant, for a total of 144 cells, and there are four sub-angles per each watchtower quadrant for a total of 120 cells per watchtower quadrant, and a total of 480 sub-angle cells for the whole model, where 144 plus 480 equals 624 total. However, by using this uneven and apparently imbalanced ratio of 6 rows by 5 columns per each sub-angle, defounded or found a system firmly rooted to the fertile ground of number theory, because 144, the sum of all cells for the four deacon crosses, is not only 6 times 24, or 12 squared, but it is also the 12th iteration, including zero, occurring on the Fibonacci sequence of additive sums that forms the famous phi ratio spiral. Thus, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 
21, 34, 55, 89, 144, etc. 144. The sum of all the cells in the four deacon crosses is 12 times 12. And 156. The sum of all cells per each watchtower quadrant is 12 times 13. If D had drafted the Enochian system even slightly differently at this stage, the result would be drastically different in the final tabulations. If each of the four watchtower quadrants had 144 cells, only 12 squared, then the full model, excluding the black cross dividing between them, would have had 576 cells in total. If each of the four watchtower quadrants had 169 cells, 13 times 13, then the full model, likewise excluding the black cross, would have had 676 cells in total. Only D's unique combination of 13 rows and 12 columns yields the sum 624. And, given the options of 576 and 676, the sum 624 is by far the most versatile in corresponding multiple systems in a single framework. 576 plus 48 equals 624. 676 minus 52 equals 624. 48 equals 12 times 4. 52 equals 13 times 4. 12 times 48 equals 576. 12 times 52 equals 624. 13 times 48 equals 624. 13 times 52 equals 676. Because of D's four watchtower Enochian system being 624 cells total in four quadrants of 156 cells each, D's model is provided with an additional dimension that Descartes' coordinate plane when measured solely as a square, although similarly divided into four quadrants, cannot have. In short, it allows for measuring the dimension of time. Now, what is time, exactly? If time truly is anything more than merely what we measure using calendars and clocks, then it may be seen as an invisible force taking the form of a cycle, a repetitive pattern such as a spiral orbit inside a larger non-correlated area, such as in three-dimensional space, and measured by environmental changes due to this force occurring on objects moving along or within that pattern. In this manner, time is simultaneously an invisible force inducing entropic motion. A spiral pattern conserving angular trajectory into negentropic orbitals and the consequential environmental changes occurring to all objects including calendars and clocks due to this force. D's base 156 Enochian system model works as a very complex form of calendar, similarly to an interlocking mechanical gear interface, and with a similar design to a standard clock face. Consider it simply thus, as a set of 16 sub-angles, incidentally of 30 cells apiece. Next, consider the four sub-angles at the inner core 
as independent from the twelve sub-angles that surround and box the men. Now, here we have the four core sub-angles, capable of symbolizing the four elemental seasons on Earth, and the twelve surrounding sub-angles, likewise symbolizing the twelve zodiacal months in each earthly orbital year, the core set measuring the environmental changes, and the surrounding set measuring the cyclical shape that causes them. Consider each surrounding sub-angle a month, and the whole calendar round shape a year, and you will see that the flat rectangle expressed in two dimensions as the four Enochian watchtowers is, in true reality, a depiction of a circulating sinusoidal spiral seen from a point aligned directly above its centroid. From this it follows that there is, by necessity, a single accurate arrangement for the entirety of attributes assigned to this system later by the Golden Dawn, because these attributes are finite in sum and all are relative to each other. In other words, S. L. Mather's work on resolving the twelve zodiac signs from three recombinations, rows, of the four elements, columns, using the divine holy name of God, or tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -he, and from thence applying these to D's Enochian system, is valid, but was left incomplete, at least in Rigardi's presentation of Mather's material in his Golden Dawn handbook, once worked through to its final logical extension, Mather's Concourse of the Forces diagrams proved to correlate to Dee's own vision of the roundhouse schematics, and both appear to function as measurements of motion on the four watchtowers' tablet design. These motions are indicated simply enough by arrows pointing up or down and slanted left or right, or vice versa, assigned to each sub-angle, based on the orientation of each zodiac sign to its nearest neighbors in each sub-angle's recombination of the four elements. My own integrated reformed vector system presents Mather's attributes on D's model as accurately to reality as possible. Mather's Golden Dawn attributes are, obviously, not the only such sort of system that may be applied to Dee's Enochian model. The sixteen sub-angles also may be likened to the sixteen primary symbols of geomancy in a kind of Kabbalistic Book of Changes, but far more significantly, the twenty kin, day names, or the nineteen weenal, months, of the Mayan calendar may be fit into each sub-angle of thirty cells, and likewise rearranged so that no two are alike, as can the Sixty-four hexagrams of the I Ching be arranged on D's model to repeat exactly five times each by their occupying 320 of the 480 total cells in all 16 sub-angles. And so, likewise, can the 36 deacons of the ancient Egyptian solar civic calendar be placed on each deacon cross for a total of four deacon crosses of 144 total cells. The exact calibration of all these attributes onto D's Watchtower's tablet model I call the Atlantean calendar because it theoretically 
may have predated the world flood. The Atlantean calendar's elemental predictions only differ from reality as we experience it daily to the extent that the calendar symbolizes an idealized fourth dimensional metaform, a holy template on which our own reality is loosely based. While the reality we experience daily is an imperfect copy several steps removed from this original ideal pattern. In the same manner Kepler rightly estimated the distances of the planetary orbits away from the Sun using the inverse square law, etc., by working backward from an earlier observationally inaccurate yet more ideal model, his Harmonia Mundi material, we may make accurate predictions about future events in reality based on the position of the attributes at the corresponding time on the calendar. The events we experience in our mundane material reality differ only in slight discrepancies from the outcomes predicted for each moment by the complete Atlantean calendar. Indeed, their differences can be said to be in degree, if not only, then at least mostly, and certainly more so than in detail. What the 22 trump cards of Tarot are for the archetypal psychological hero's journey, describing the human monomyth, the Atlantean calendar is for the arrangements of elements throughout our entire Milky Way galaxy over duration of no fewer than 12 aeons of 2,000 years apiece. The Atlantean calendar is a one-to-one -one scalable map of time. It may be speculated that Enochian angels are the guardians of time in much the same way the archangels protect about heaven and cacodemons proliferate in hell. Or rather, as the mind may expand or contract within three space and thus experience angelic or demonic visions while doing so, so too may the mind move forward or backward along the mainstream timeline, observe all eddying branches off it as the Enochian system, and encounter their own past id, atavism, and future superego, avatar, through the means of remote viewing or scrying while meditating on the Atlantean calendar. However, always heed the warning that a mind, once distended, can never regain its original dimensions. And so, likewise, it may be said that once one has left their body, one may as well have lost their mind, because, as it is also said, you can never step in the same river twice, and, for that reason, it is true that you can never go home again once you have set out in pursuit of practical magic. Indeed, practical or ritual magic, including Enochian theurgy, may be merely a vestigial memory left over from a time prior to the world flood when a higher technology was present, allowing people greater control over their immediate surroundings. It is highly likely the rituals modern practical magic imitate date back at least to the Neolithic Kurgan peoples who built megalithic tumulus mounds by erecting a small tabletop of two or more upright monolithic menhirs supporting a final capstone 
lintel monolith buried under soil. The likelihood of these Kurgan mounds being a direct predecessor of long later Native American sweat lodges is nearly entirely inarguable, and the Kurgan culture's origin from just west of the Black Sea places them at the genetic source point for the also long later Paracas culture of Peru, South America, who elongated their skulls by cranial deformation. The more or less worldwide by then, Kurgan culture were, most probably, responsible for, at least 8,000 years ago, constructing the temple complex at Gobikli Tape, found in modern-day Turkey, as an underground granary or seed bank. The Kurgan culture are also, although eponymously mound builders, credited with the invention of the wheel and the first taming of wild horses. In their beginning, the Kurgans may have been contemporary to the final extinction of the Neanderthals, a cousin species to our own modern Homo sapien species, as well as to the earliest development of speech and verbal communication, and by the end of the Neolithic era, just before the semi-nomadic Kurgan culture was finally, seemingly, subsumed into Sumero-Akkadian city-states, which later unified as the earliest empire, that of Babylon. The last Kurgans were certainly witness to the advent of the agrarian revolution, thatched reed-reinforced mud hut houses arranged in irrigated proto-cities, widespread use of baked clay pottery, the first metallurgy, earliest slavery, first priests, first cults to become religions, first polities, city-states governed by kings, and the eldest written languages. This shrinking Kurgan culture's final contribution may have been the gold shekel, the first metal coin used for money, possibly prior to their apparent migration to Peru to become the Paracas people. All of this remains, of course, only speculation as of the exact moment in history in which I am writing this, because archaeological excavations of sites the age of Gobikli tape and older are still very uncommon. This situation is made even more difficult at present because of Western military powers, including the United States and Israel, having brought war to the entire Middle Eastern Levant region to destabilize their perceived competitors there and to seize the elemental assets of the lands mainly the fossil fuel, crude oil. Nevertheless, it is an acceptable hypothesis that whatever we might today call superstitious, ritual, or practical magic had begun by the time of the Kurgan civilization. The practice of burial of the dead, even including grave good, gifts for the corpse in its afterlife is likely what sparked the initiation of the Kurgan culture. Beyond this, we can only guess where ritual magic began. Prior to the Kurgan culture, we nowadays know also of migrations of early Homo sapiens northwestward from Australia across a land bridge then still connecting it to South Asia, 
where modern Indonesia and Polynesia are today, in the region called Oceania. The continuous use there of cowrie shell money and the cat's cradle weaving game played with a loop of string do indicate the origins of, at least, the first rudimentary metaphysics then and there. What this rudimentary metaphysics indicated was the nature of time being seen as the difference between an object and itself, symbolized as, simply, two cubes synthesized into one by sharing a side, or the earliest form of Kabbalah, what we would now call a tesseract. This prehistoric preoccupation with time stems from our age-old superstitious terror about mortality. This, combined with learning the ability to mentally keep count of large number sums and calculate basic arithmetic, led to the earliest metaphysics, and thus to the oldest now known form of ritual or ceremonial magic. This is indicated somewhat by Paleolithic cave paintings, which could only have been rendered by firelight, being too deeply obscured from even reflected sunlight, as most are. The shaman would stand between the firelight and the cave painting and tell the young the epic tale of the hunt by casting their shadow against the wall. This evolved into Plato's allegory of the cave in regards to seeking enlightenment beyond merely the immediately observable and, by modernity, to silver screen cinema in stadium seating movie theaters selling mute audiences on a false hope of becoming stars. In the end, as they say in the pictures, there is only one truth. All facts are merely versions of it. The moral of all words will always be the same as that of this monomyth, expressing, simply, adaptation to environmental changes over time, resulting in survival and mating. This simple formula of sex and violence being the sugar and spice used to flavor a story about a character or characters who have to show progress away from their start by the end of the narrative is most likely also oceanic in origins as the rituals and unwritten stories of the area preserve intact a tradition dating back to the division of Australia from India and incorporate all the original primordial symbols of this essential monomythic tale, the cosmic mound, the world tree, the division of man and woman, the war between the younger Olympian and the elder, Titan, gods. And finally, the world flood. These elemental symbols of humanity's monomyth cannot presently be traced back any further than to the era of the Oceanic Land Bridge, which had ended by 8,000 years ago, along with the melting of the final glaciers over North America that had restored the ocean water level to its current heights. Just as we have now looked back in time, mentally, we may next return our attentions again to the present moment and, by doing so, 
perform the same transform on our astral body, our aura, or soul, as we would to project our mind's eye ahead into the far-off future and mentally see ahead of time. We have to bring ourselves forward through time to return from the past and to be projected into the future and backward through time to return from the future and to delve into the past and we have to bring ourselves back to the present either way when we are done but again what is time can a timeline such as the mainstream forward flowing arrow of entropy be broken and if so can it then be mended and restored back to its prior normalcy picture the four watchtowers of the Enochian system as alike the four walls of a single cube as in the altar model proposed in book four by Aleister Crowley based on the material of the Golden Dawn now picture the inside of this cube as like the usual color-coded watchtowers and the exterior as like the Atlantean calendar this is the complete Enochian communications system when applied to the scale of the entire planet Earth the ECS allows an instantaneously attainable, globally reaching, telepathic link to connect one part of anyone's mind to another part of anyone else's. This happens all the time, more or less unconsciously, but is usually only expressed in the vague symbolisms of subconscious dreams and then it is so only by one's own ego reflecting over itself disguised as an alienated otherness within the mystifying mists of sleep the ECS functions basically like a psychic switchboard where every circuit is being connected disconnected and reconnected to every other as cause and effect always each color-coded truncated pyramid cell on the entire ECS four watchtowers altar walls is a spiraling vortex that can open a wormhole portal to connect to any other this model is an intangible cube the same volume as the earth and just as each cell in it may connect to any other so too may it communicate to the cells of the unfolded Atlantean calendar model measuring across the whole planar Milky Way the cells of the ECS around the earth and the Akashic records of the Milky Way in the form of the Atlantean calendar also communicate between one another and all these communications happen invisibly and at faster than light speeds likewise all these cells communicate with Kabbalah's ultimate extension outward as the Tao sub Tao tesseract surrounding our parent cosmos these are all layers and levels of a single unified holistic model the Enochian communications system which relates also then to the psyche of each sentient individual in a similar switchboard like manner connecting one part of the brain here to another there along the neurons in our cerebra
Again, however, this entire model is only an idealized metaform version of what appears to be the case in observable material reality. Instead of the tesseract of time, there are the intergalactic filaments strung about like a super slow motion lightning bolt. Instead of the Atlantean calendar superimposed upon the Milky Way's galactic spiral, there is only the black hole in the direction away from us of the constellation Sagittarius A in the core of the galaxy, sending out gravity waves to influence all the stars and all the planets orbiting around it in the four swirling arms that form the plane of its accretion disk. Instead of the four watchtowers, walled, cubed, surrounding the planet Earth, it is only Earth's own electromagnetic field, caught into field lines and currents by Earth's gravity well. And instead of Kether, the crown sephirot of Hakabalah, or highest emanation of illumination from the Godhead, resting on the brows of all sentient minds, it is only doing so to some, a few, or even only just one at a time.